Today I wanted to talk about something that is uh, very much in the news and has been in the news for a long, long time. And there doesn't seem to be any end in sight to what I'm talking about, and that is the foreclosure crisis, the housing crisis. You know, this foreclosure crisis has crawled on for four years now. In fact, the latest Case-Shiller housing index fell 3.4% during October from a year ago. Despite the fact that every year all the pundits say this is the bottom in housing. In fact, in, in June of 2009, CNBC's Jim Cramer, and I know you get all of your news from Jim Cramer, <laughs> he told his mad money viewers that the residential real estate had finally found a floor. The next year, the CEO of Toll Brothers, Douglas Yearly, he said in late 2010, the recovery is here to stay. Yet Case Shiller continues to fall and fall and fall. And you know, if that wasn't bad enough, I don't know if you read this, but in the last few weeks, the National Association of Realtors finally fessed up. They finally fessed up because they said they've been overstating sales for the previous, uh, previous three years in terms of their counting up of sales. Yeah, three million sales that they said happened never happened. So when you adjust that out, if you think some things have been bad, well, actual sales were 14% worse than what they had actually said. And in fact, in 2010, it was 14.6% less than what they would said. But that didn't stop uh, Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan Chase the other day. He sat down with uh, NBC's Maria Bartiromo, and uh, he also said that, again, the housing market has bottomed. Really? Well, the fact is nobody knows how bad the housing market is, and they don't know how bad the housing market is going to be. And just think about this. Core Logic, who does work in this area, uh, projects that the shadow inventory, and shadow inventory being uh, foreclosures waiting to happen but not yet on the market, is 1.6 million homes throughout the United States. 1.6 sounds like a big number. But think about this. Recently, there was a deposition where an attorney uh, who was deposed, a bankruptcy attorney who was deposed, said under oath, and the attorneys I know, when they're under oath in a deposition, tell the truth. Now, I don't know, you might have your opinions on whether lawyers tell the truth any other time, but when they're under oath, they tend to tell the truth. What he said was that Fannie Mae representatives told him that there were 600,000 Fannie Mae homes, mortgages in shadow inventory. 600,000, just with Fannie Mae. Not in the United States, just in the state of Florida. 600,000 shadow inventory, Fannie Mae only, not Freddie Mac, not J.P. Morgan, not B of A, but just in the state of Florida, Fannie Mae. So I don't think CoreLogic's uh, estimation of the mortgage overhand is in any way, shape, or form close to being reality. Fact is, housing prices have fallen from 2007, 2009, 33% below their 2006 peak. Now, we haven't seen declines on this scale since the Great Depression. And what that means in dollars and cents is in the aggregate, $7 trillion of household equity, home equity, the difference between the value of the, your home and what you owe on your home, 
The difference between that in the aggregate has fallen $7 trillion. That's more than half, more than half of the aggregate home equity that exist, existed in early 2006. It's all been gone, wiped out. Now, the Federal Reserve's doing a lot of work on this lately. I don't know if you've noticed, but they just came out with a white paper last week. And they say that there's 12 million homes underwater. 12 million homes where the debt on the home is higher than the value of the, of the underlying collateral. And the aggregate negative equity is $700 billion. Of these mortgages, 8.6 million of them are current. We continue to have people who are, there's probably people in this audience that continue to pay and pay and pay despite the fact that they have negative equity of roughly $425 billion in the aggregate. But they continue to pay. But even the Federal Reserve knows, given this situation, there's continual problems in the housing market. Bill Dudley, president, he's actually my favorite uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, talking head because he says such stupid things. But this one I think he may have right. The Federal Reserve, Bill Dudley from the Federal Reserve wrote that uh, continued house price declines could lead to even more defaults, more foreclosures, and distress sales, undermining wealth, confidence, and spending. Breaking this vicious cycle is one of the most pressing issues facing policymakers. Of course, I would contend and will contend during this talk that policymakers should just butt out. But uh, the at least is aware of the potential for further uh, fall in housing prices and the effect that that's, going to, that that's going to have. Now, Ben Bernanke figures he's done all he can do. He's, he said the Federal Reserve has made enormous efforts to try to help this economy recover and stabilize through the control of interest rates or monetary policy, he said. These policies have driven uh, interest rates to record lows, record lows. Yeah, zero is, uh, is pretty low. Uh, monetary policy can do a lot, he says, but monetary policy is not a panacea. So on the housing crisis, Bernanke said strong government program to help the industry recover would aid the Fed's own efforts to boost the housing, uh, boost housing by driving mortgage rates lower. He said, and the, and the Fed white paper that I mentioned earlier mentions three problems in housing. Credit worthy borrowers cannot find mortgages. Number two, the foreclosure process is costly and inefficient. And number three, the persistent excess supply of homes on the market. Those people at the Fed know exactly what's going on. They've identified there's excess supply of homes. It's amazing. Now the gang at the Fed writes that there's, there's really, if, if there's no policy to action to address these problems, then they say, and I quote, the, the adjustment process will take longer and incur more dead weight losses causing home prices low, sending home prices lower and thereby prolonging the downward pressure on the wealth of current homeowners and the resultant drag on the economy at large. Now, of course, econ Austrian economists know that it's actually policy action that has prolonged this crisis already and more government intervention is only going to make matters worse. For instance, I can think of nothing worse than to have Fannie and Freddie be the largest land landlords in the United States. Can you imagine that they own the majority of rental property? But that's what they're talking about doing. That they're talking about there's a policy initiative out there that Fannie Mae and, uh, and Freddie Mac become take ownership of these properties and rent them out just to get them uh, out of the supply chain. Also, I think it's terrible policy to get government more involved with the home modification market. It clearly hasn't worked to this point, and it won't work going forward. 
Now, this has been a big, uh, not a, 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 a big issue on the campaign trail, but it has been mentioned in at least one or two debates, and every one of the uh, Republican candidates have been asked about what they would do with, uh, about the housing crisis. And uh, in fact, Newt Gingrich said he would rewrite the rules to make it profitable for banks to renegotiate loan principal amounts. That's Newt Gingrich's big idea. Good old Newt, he wants to make sure that his banking buddies can uh, write off principal and come out smelling like a rose. After all, Gingrich earned 1.6 to 1.8 billion dollars or million dollars uh, working for mortgage giant Freddie Mac. His critics claim he was lobbying, but you know, Newt says that he maintained he maintains that he only offered strategic uh, advice as a historian. Now, we have some historians in the audience. I think Tom DiLorenzo is a historian. Have, have you ever made $1.6 million working for Fannie or Freddie? Have they called you? Would you? They have called you. And, <laughs> and, and thankfully, Tom DiLorenzo turned them down, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a big hand. <laughs> Well, a reporter said that Newt disagrees with his Republican colleagues about the free market, that the free market will find a way uh, to let the banks and the homeowners work things out. Well, you know, that remains to, uh, that remains to be seen. Now, uh, President Obama, of course, has gotten in this fray, and his big idea, if you remember, he said he came in and was able to adjust Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac rules to allow people to refinance loans even when they are 125% uh, loan to value. So that means if you were 25% underwater on your mortgage, President Obama made it easier for you to go ahead and refinance. He said that this uh, policy would save homeowners thousands and thousands of dollars, and this is his way of solving the housing crisis. Princeton professor Alan Blinder, he's, uh, of course, he's one of these go-to economic wise men. He, he penned an op-ed in the uh, Wall Street Journal, and his idea was to force lenders to reduce principal amounts, and uh, of course, that's gonna cost money, and he believes that the banks and you guys should share the cost in that. Taxpayers and banks. Only with the proviso that if the home does eventually go up in value, that the government be able to uh, get an equity kicker if the prices go back up. Now, Blinder also thinks that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury should provide cheap financing to developers to go ahead and buy up properties with the intention of renting them out. Again, it's similar to that Fannie and Freddie being in the rental business. Uh, Martin Feldstein of Harvard, you always need a Harvard man to weigh in on this. He put in his two cents worth for the New York Times, and he points out that, that homes have dropped 40%, and the result, he said, less consumer spending. That's what he's worried about. But he claims that the government can stop the fall of prices by just slicing off the amount of mortgage anyone has that is in excess of 110% of loan to value. So if you're 10% underwater, or if you're more than 10% underwater, then Feldstein would just come in and, uh, and do away with anything um, above that, and he said that would fix things. He says the policy would cost $350 billion or less, and it would modify $11 million, or 11 million loans that are underwater in America. Now, of course, who's going who's to pick up this cost? Well, the banks and the government are going to split. Again, the government is you and you and you and you and you is going to pick up uh, the cost here. He said in the case of mortgages held by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and this is a direct quote, the government would just be paying itself. Presumably, he wrote that with a straight face. 
uh, when he did this. So, and, and of course, if, if you had a, a mortgage that was underwater by over 10, 10% and you allowed the government to expunge that debt that uh, exceeded that, the borrowers would then accept full recourse uh, for the rest of their mortgage. Now what that means is, uh, I don't know what kind of, what this law is in Texas, but in many states, uh, mortgages are essentially non-recourse. So if you're foreclosed upon and the home brings less than what you owe at a foreclosure sale, there is a, what's called a deficiency and uh, in non-recourse uh, states, then the lender cannot come after the homeowner for that deficiency. And, but in this case, in the Feldstein plan, uh, that would that would be reworked to the and uh, borrowers would have to accept full recourse for doing that. Feldstein said, "I cannot agree with those who say we should just let housing prices continue to fail till they stop by themselves. Also, although some forest fires are allowed to burn out naturally, no one lets fires continue to burn when they threaten residential neighborhoods." But the fact is that recovering 33% of a fall in housing prices is just going to, from the 2006 peak, is going to take years and years and years and years. It's not going to, it's not going to snap back anytime soon. This is going to take forever. So, I mean, despite the obvious policymakers and wonks, they think this trimming of, of mortgage principal down to just 10% underwater or allowing people to refinance when they're 25% underwater or more will somehow halt the slide in home values and somehow spur consumer spending. The belief is, is that if, you know, if you're just kind of, sort of underwater, uh, then you're just going to keep faithfully paying Fannie and Freddie and B of A and J.P. Morgan Chase uh, until the rest of time. Never mind that it's going to take years and years and years. In fact, you'll probably pass away before you ever have any equity in your home. So all of these ideas to save the housing market and supposedly to increase uh, consumer spending are doing just the opposite. These people keep, uh, keep people chained to the homes that they're still in. They can't move to where better jobs are. In fact, there's this... Uh, a great example of this that was uh, brought out, I believe it was in a USA Today article, that uh, there's a heavy equipment operator in North Las Vegas, Nevada, and he bought his home at the peak um, and in 2006. And he's, uh, there is very little need for heavy equipment operators in North Las Vegas anymore. They're needed in Oklahoma. He has the opportunity to go to Oklahoma and get a job but he is $200,000 underwater on his home. So he can't leave. And he feels compelled morally to keep paying, but he's unemployed and he's, he's running, out of, running out of money and running out of time. Now, the blinder and the Feldstein proposals would take about $190,000 off his mortgage. But the problem is, it's not gonna get him a new job. So you can reduce you can reduce principal amounts, but they're not going to be enough and they're not going to put them back to work. The idea is that the two big to fail banks will cut, and the idea that the two big to fail banks are going to hold up their hand and say, sure, we'll cover, we'll cover half the cost of this is, is crazy because that's going to come exactly out of their bottom line. They don't have enough capital to cover that. And if they did do that, they would immediately go to Washington, D.C. with a tin cup in their hand and say, we need another TARP bailout. So it'd be TARP 2, TARP 3, and so on, just to accomplish that. And by the way, how much bureaucracy would be needed to manage a program of somehow uh, cutting everyone's mortgage amount down to 110% uh, loan to value? Imagine the appraisal duels that will go on. Anybody who's purchased a house or tried to refi a house know what kind of boondoggles involved with getting appraisals and, and uh, one appraisal versus another appraisal. I mean, it'd be a nightmare. It would never, 
it would take so long, nothing would ever happen. All of these plans are really nothing to aid underwater homeowners. The only thing it does is aid Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the rest of the too big to fail banks. Now, there's thousands of stories of people trying to do the right thing. People going to their banks, they're current on their payments, they walk in and want to renegotiate because they say, listen, we're $100,000 under, uh, underwater on our home, we're $150,000 on our home, $200,000. And they go into their banks, and what do the banks do? They refuse to negotiate with them. Why? Because these people are current. And they'll say, you're current. We don't, we're not going to talk to you about this. Why don't you go ahead and skip a couple, three payments, and then come back and we'll start talking to you about this. And then they go through this whole grind of trying to do the government uh, re uh, renegotiation uh, process. But all the time that the banks are not negotiating with these homeowners, they are holding these mortgages on their books at 100 cents on the dollar when there's no way the mortgage is worth that. Because if you have a $200,000 mortgage secured by a, a house that's worth $100,000, that mortgage is not worth, on a bank's books, $200,000. But that's what the banks want to pretend, and by pretending to do that, they're still in business. Now, Mitt Romney laid out his prescription for the Amer uh, America's housing crisis when he was campaigning in New uh, Nevada a couple of months ago. And he said the policymakers shouldn't try and stop the foreclosure process. He said, let it run its course and hit bottom. In the state, uh, Nevada, which has the highest foreclosure rate in the country, he took a lot of flack for this. And in fact, the governor of the state, Brian Sandoval, had some very harsh words for for Romney. But a few, a few months later, or a few weeks later, the GOP uh, had a, 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 a CNBC debate, and Romney again declared that as president he would do nothing to ease the housing crisis. Markets work, he says. Well, Mr. Romney is right. Markets do work. But any business dominated by entities only in business, by the good graces of the government, is not the free market. It cannot be considered the free market. The reason the housing market is not cleared is that the government stands in the way by propping up the large mortgage holders. No reasonable person sees Fannie, sees Freddie, um, which were seized by the government in September of 2008 as the product of spontaneous order. To stay in business, the two firms together have needed $169 billion to stay in business. That's $169 billion in taxpayer money to keep them in business. And there is no end in sight. Every quarter, Fannie and Freddie Freddie, the uh, friend of Newt Gingrich, um, go to the taxpayer, say, I've, we've lost X billion dollars and we need X billion more. That's the only reason they're in business. Also, at the same time, there's been changes to FASB's uh, Fair County Standards Board rules. Their numbers 157, 115, 124. This essentially allows banks to value certain assets on their books at whatever they want to. Now, if you can allow banks to uh, value these mortgages that are underwater at whatever they want to, you are essentially keeping them in business essentially by government fiat. They are in business because the government has just merely changed the rules for their benefit and they are essentially wards of the state. And that's the problem. Bailouts attempt to erase the effect of losses or economic failure. Profit and loss go together. It's like up and down, left and right, good and bad. If we do away with losses, we wind up 
diluting the meaning of profit. After all, why strive for profits if Uncle Sam is just going to prop you up? Bailouts destroy the profit motive and the incentive to work with customers. And that's what it's done in the case of the mortgage market. The real help for homeowners will only arrive with Fannie and Freddie, and the rest will be allowed to fail. The equivalent of a Chapter 7 bankruptcy proceeding, liquidation, would put the underwater loans out for bid in the marketplace. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing that when Mr. Romney says, let the market hit bottom, he does not have in mind Fannie, Freddie, and B of A being allowed to fail. I mean, I'm guessing that Mitt doesn't have that in mind, but that's what needs to happen. He believes that it's a free market for you and I. It's a free market for the people who sign on the dotted line on their mortgage, pay X amount per month, you have 30 years to pay, uh, the note doesn't say anything about the value of the collateral, you just can't pay until the very end. But 12 million households right now have a mortgage on something that isn't an asset anymore. It will never be an asset. It will continue to be a liability probably as long as they live. And there's no difference in that than being a renter. And if the rent of a similar structure is half that or a third that, then the only thing it makes sense to do is to walk away. Now you might say, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doug. We, we, we believe in contracts. People must honor them for the market to work. But the market hasn't been allowed to work on the other side of the equation since the housing crisis began. In fact, Bloomberg had to go to court to obtain documents to shed how much light, or shed light on how much dough the Federal Reserve really provided the banks during 2000, 2008 meltdown. The banks and the Fed fought this so hard that it had to go all the way to the Supreme Court. And finally the Supreme Court said, no, you have to hand over. You had to hand over these documents, 29,000 pages. And it revealed that banks worldwide made $13 billion on the difference between their, what they paid for their emergency funding and what they earned with that funding. When you total up, when you add up the guarantees and the lending limits that the Fed provided, the bailout wasn't $700 billion that everybody complains about in TARP money. The total was $7.77 trillion uh, as of March 2009 in rescuing the financial system. More than half the value of everything that was produced in the United States that year. Now here's just one example. Not only did B of A receive $45 billion in TARP money, which most everybody knows about, what everybody doesn't know about is at the peak, Bank of America borrowed another $91.4 billion from the Fed to stay alive. Now they buy, borrowed this from a very kind of alphabet soup of programs. There was dozens of them. Just a few of them were AMLF, PDCF, TSLF, STOMO, TAF, you get the idea, it just goes on and on. It's like these guys strung acronyms together just for the, the heck of it to create these loan programs. But they borrowed 91, on top of the 45 billion in TARP money, they got 91.4 billion in loans, secretly from the Fed, that we didn't find out about until just the other day. And it wasn't like a daylight overdraft, just because it, B of A was a little short of dough, you know, for a day or two. Bank of America was in debt to the Federal Reserve for 518 days. During the dark days of March 2009, government bailout funds amounted to over 400% of Bank of America's market cap. There is no question the Bank of America was bankrupt, and probably still is. And that's not how the free market works. 
But they want the free market to work for the person who's paying on their mortgage, but they don't want the free market to work on the entity that owns the mortgage. Now, let's say Bank of America, which, by the way, absorbed countrywide, so that was included in there. Let's imagine if they were allowed to go bankrupt, as they should, in a free market, in the free market that Mitt Romney wants to talk about. What would happen? What would these mortgages sell for if they were part of the banks, if they were under the control of a bankruptcy trustee and put on the free market? Would they sell for 110%? of the home's value? Would they sell for 125% of the home's value? Like the Feldstein and the Obama plans? No, when you're out looking for a mortgage, you better have it 20% down, you're looking for an 80% loan to value mortgage. And in fact, if you look at what distressed sellers are receiving for assets and loans that they sell on the market, it is likely that these mortgages would go for 25 or 35 cents on the dollar. And what buyers of those notes would do, the first thing they would do is trying to make, keep these people in their homes, trying to make these loans conforming and performing, that's the first thing they would do. In fact, there's examples of this in the marketplace. Louis Ranieri, who is a, a legend in the mortgage business, worked at Solomon Brothers, for those of you who uh, uh, ever read uh, Michael Lewis's great book, Liar's Poker. He has a new fund called Celine Residential Mortgage Opportunity Fund. It's featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Buys up distressed debt, not to, not to better society, but to make a profit. And they made the example of a, a couple in St. George, Utah, that um, had been delinquent on their loan. They owed 421000 on their mortgage. Celine came to them immediately, restructured the loan, reduced the principal to $243,000, and reduced their payment from $3,500 a month down to $1,500 a month. All of a sudden, they had a performing loan on their hand, and both parties benefit. 90% of the loans that Celine does modifications for involve reducing principal less than 2% of the modifications that the government does involve reducing principal. And while many upside down uh, borrowers can't find uh, anyone to talk to when they're trying to negotiate with their, uh, with their lender, when Celine buys a note, the first thing they do is reach out to the borrower very quickly. In fact, they will send them a FedEx package with a gift card in it that can only be activated once the borrower makes contact with Celine's debt uh, specialist. It's hard to imagine that Fannie or Freddie might do something like that. Now this is much different than what Mr. Gingrich has in mind, where he's thinking that current mortgage holders can somehow write down loans and make a profit at it. That's not who should make a profit. The current mortgage holder should be allowed to go broke. F firms that lose money should be allowed to fail. Otherwise, precious capital continues to be wasted by these firms. The firms that should make money on this are the opportunist, are opportunistic firms like Celine Capital. They must profit and they must benefit by buying these for, uh, loans out of foreclosure, by making these loans performing and conforming, and going ahead and second, selling them into the secondary market. They profit, and the homeowner benefits. You know, Ludwig von Mises explained that one government intervention leads to endless successions of interventions to deal with the effects of the first and subsequent interventions. Ultimately, it comes down to two choices, he said. Either capitalism or socialism. There exists no middle way. Likewise, there is no middle way in solving the housing crisis. For capitalism to work its magic, for underwater homeowners to be set free, mortgage holders must be 
allowed to fail. Thank you.